Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. I'm here with Quinn Reed, uh, bi gender writer and podcaster. And I'd like to start, if I may, by reading a little bit about uh, Quinn's podcast, All the Genders. It's an interview podcast about the lived experience of people with very gendered identities and others from around the LGBTQ world, LGBTQ plus, that's us and most of our audience, I would surmise. Uh, All the Genders is an interview podcast where by gender host Quinn, who's with us today, talks with people of many identities about their lived experience of gender and queer issues. It's meant for queer folks, allies, folks who are questioning, and anyone interested in LGBTQ plus and identity issues. Welcome, Quinn. Thank you so much. It's great to be here, Anne. You're very busy. I'm glad that you could fit us in. This was the one time you could do it, and luckily it is coming to pass. I'm interested in way too many things. That's <laughs> oh, the there are never too many interests. Um, I noticed in your podcast, as we were saying before we taped, that you ask interviewees to introduce themselves, and I think that's a great idea. So let me imitate you and ask you to introduce yourself to our audience, if you would. Sure. Um, Yes, I'm Quinn, she, her, or they, them. And um, I'm a writer and a podcaster on an amateur level. I'm a dancer and a musician. Uh, I've written plays and nonfiction books and short stories and unpublished novels. Um, but podcasting has allowed me to really tap into just some wonderful experiences talking with people. And I'm kind of expanding that in a way that I think we'll get to later in the discussion. I think it's really fun talking to people. And uh, the, I, I like the interform, interview format best when it turns into a conversation, you know? Yes, me too. Um, so how did you happen to start this podcast? I think it mainly came about because I was having, pardon me, so many really interesting conversations with all kinds of queer people that I felt like I wished other people could hear. There's so many people out there who can broaden my understanding of what life is, of what gender is, of what queerness is, of what love is. Um, And they have so much to share. And I just kind of want to drag them out into a place where people can hear them and see them. and participate in some of these conversations. And I'm kind of, my conversational style in normal life is kind of a bit like an interview. I'm just very interested in how people got to where they are, how they feel about things they're doing, what makes them uh, feel enthusiastic. Um, So basically the conversations were already happening. The only thing we added was recording them. Um, how long have you been doing this podcast? It's about a year and a half now, although there was, um, we, we took what I guess I'll call a season break uh, until a few months ago. And so we're now into season two. And you record every other week. As of yes. Or 17. Yes. Although I am sometimes remiss in getting the engineering done on time. Every other week is the cadence that we are seeking, and I have some great episodes actually stacked up, ready to release once I'm finished with them. You want to give us a preview, or should we wait? Sure. Uh, Well, a couple of them. um, 
One is with someone who's been really involved in the Canadian theater scene. And it's really interesting how um, theater and film and TV have begun to notice the existence of people who are not cisgender um, and people who are not just one gender. Um, and it, and so it's uh, that conversation was really interesting to me to sort of hear about some of the experience during this period recently when things have changed so much. Um, and then I've also got a second episode with author Alexis Hall, who writes these delightful, as they're called, queer kissing books. Uh -oh. And I listened to the first episode and I love that it was so wide ranging. You know, uh, they're British, right? Yes. Talked about the British politics and Liz Truss getting booted out, which was delightful. And then uh, you mentioned bled, red, white, and almost blue, that novel. And I couldn't, my uh, video, my audio was bad, so I couldn't quite get what you said about it. I personally hated the book, but that's just me. Right. It's not. It's not going to be for all audiences, but for instance, the book that I really latched on to of Alexis Hall's is um, a romance called A Lady for a Duke. It's kind of a very traditional uh, romance. Um, I'm not generally speaking interested in hearing stories about aristocracy or anything, but this one centers a trans woman and the way she's brought to the life really appealed to me. And I I'm always looking for more experiences of reading about or hearing about or watching other trans people because it helps me understand myself and it helps me understand my place in the world. And I should mention I'm bi-gender, so sometimes I'm male and sometimes I'm female, and I generally make my presentation cue as closely as I can to the gender I'm experiencing. Um, so there's there's a whole lot I want to know about in the world to sort of know how to approach the world myself. I should we should clarify that what red, white, and almost blue is not Alexis Hall, but Casey McQuiston. And it's so popular. And there's going to be a movie. And I read the New York Times book review, and it's on the bestseller list. It's resurfaced. And you know, so I think. You and Alexis might have been talking about um, a different kind of diversity, what kind of passes as diversity to cisgender white guys getting involved. But I, you know, my audio wasn't what it might have been. Oh, and just one note Casey McQuiston's book is Red, White, and Royal Blue. I knew it. I knew I was getting it wrong. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good. Oh, no problem. Yes. Um, maybe I'm being too unkind, but what can I say? There's no disputing about taste, some people say. Um, so you obviously read many of the, not the romances that you talked about in that interview. And you read the play that you talked about in the uh, interview before that, the Victorian play. So how much preparation do you do for each podcast? It varies a lot depending on the person. Um, I'm usually not specifically seeking someone famous or someone who's done something very public for the show, although I have had guests like that from the San Francisco Transgender District. That was a wonderful conversation. Of course, Alexis Hall and there's several playwrights um, we're going to see in a row who just have all sorts of really interesting things to say. Um, but I'm generally most interested in people's experience and then if they're an artist or if they're out there doing something in the world, how that connects for them and what that means for them. So for some people, some people who've come on are just good friends of mine who happen to be non-binary, who happen to be trans, and I just want to talk with them about their lives. And those are 
frankly, the easiest to prepare for because I already know the person. Um, and then for the others, I put in as much time as I have available. I do not have a prep team working with me. So, you know, it's know. as much as I could get. And I always feel like I always feel like I, I want to come in with more preparation. Um, but there's only so many hours in the day and I'm not going to delay talking to amazing people just because I want to be able to throw in one more sentence about one more book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, uh, the first interview I listened to was, was, was with Gustavo, whom I know personally. So there's oh. that connection too. What that was a okay, lovely so interview. Fun. And you don't have specific times. It's just, you know, that was 12 minutes, I think. And then, Oh, that one was, that was a little longer than that. I usually shoot for 30 to 45 minutes, but I'm terrible at paying attention to the time because I get wrapped up in the conversation. Exactly. Exactly. We have that in common. Um, how do you find interviewees? All kinds of ways. Um, sometimes I stalk them on the internet. Sometimes they're recommended to me by someone I know or someone I'm in touch with. Sometimes they're friends of mine. Sometimes, like in the case of Alexis Hall, I just read the book and really love the book. And there are other books that are very meaningful to me and other queer members of our family. Um, and so I took a shot and I contacted his um, sort of um, the person who handles his communications. And he was just so gracious to get back in touch. So I am I am always keeping my eyes out everywhere for folks to talk to. Mm -hmm. It's fun, isn't it? It is. It's um I I have an excuse to talk to people that I would love to talk to. Um and it's so great to come in with that, not to just say, Hey, I think you're cool and I want to talk with you for a while, mm -hmm. which it is true. But oh hey, it's for a podcast. So it's totally not like me being weird or anything. And I like, I love the preparation too, because um there's so many people, I think, there are so many interviewers on mainstream media that haven't really haven't read the book or you know, haven't listened to the podcast or, you know, and so I love thorough preparation. I'm with you with that. And it's so much fun, too. It is. My idol in this respect is Terry Gross, of course. <laughs> I feel like she comes into every interview knowing as much about the subject as the person she's interviewing, which I think she just prepares very carefully as well as very thoroughly. Like she can't read every book everybody's ever written. Um, so I think she comes into it with more of a work smarter, not harder uh, this, uh, approach, whereas mine is just work harder. Mine too. And what's amazing about Terry Gross is that she has a weekly show. Yes. I mean, I have- uh... How does she do it? I know it. I know it. And, you know, at first we have a news section of our show. We have one week as news and one week as interviews. And with the news, you know, we do all the research ourselves. We don't, you know, we don't have a teleprompter or anything. It's really. Right. Um, and our, you know, I was really kind of chagrined about that in the beginning, but my, our friend said, uh, look, you know, you don't, this is, you don't have the resources. You don't have a staff. No wonder, you know, you're feeling the pinch. And in the beginning, it was a lot of work. And now it's turned into total pleasure, all of it. Um, so you find interviewees just by word of mouth and by research, as do I. Uh, current projects, what are you up to in addition to this podcast? Uh, yes, so All the Genders is going beautifully, at least I'm really enjoying it. Let's put it that way. Um, but as I mentioned, I'm also a writer and I always need a writing outlet. And so recently I had kind of an idea for a series of stories and I was talking to my partner about it 
And she said, oh, why don't you do a serial podcast? And we talked about that for a little bit. And the idea of doing basically an old fashioned radio serial kind of thing um, in a podcast form uh, was really appealing, especially since um, there's the opportunity to center all kinds of queer characters, which the show does, and use all kinds of queer voice actors, which we do. Um, we've also got some cis folks, so it's there's there's some diversity there. That's my <laughs> version of diversity is include some, <laughs> some cisgender heterosexual folks. Um, but so the podcast is called The Scent of Gravity. It'll probably be, oh, I don't know, I would guess um, late January, early February before it comes out. And it's a queer science fiction mystery serial podcast. Uh, the plan is to do an episode every couple of weeks. And it's about um, a trans woman named Lana Quell, who <coughs> um, is from Luna, is from the moon. And she journeys to this uh, distant space station near this jump gate in space. The space station is called Free Boots um, for reasons that eventually come clear. but um, and it's populated mainly by aliens and robots and AIs and a few human beings sprinkled in and there. And the thing that's really exciting to me about that kind of context is that you get to go back and ask really fundamental questions about what it's like to be a human being, um, what gender is, what love is, what life is, and this kind of thing. There's a species of alien there um in the show um who can share memories through touch so they all feel like they've experienced everything all the others have experienced and all their forebears have experienced and they don't really think of their identities as individual so what is that what would that mean if you if you just considered yourself part of something rather than than sort of the whole show which is kind of kind of a a Buddhist idea in a sense that there is no individual, that there, we're all just part of larger things. So that's just kind of an example. Also, they have, you know, multiple genders and um, they transform for like the last day or two of their life into like a flying creature. And Oh, well, it's, um, it's just an example of how we get to examine some of these things in the context of this mystery. Well, this woman journeying to this place, she really doesn't want to go to try to find her ex uh, estranged sister who's been abducted under mysterious circumstances. Well, we'll have to have you on again, and I'll ask my partner, our co-host, to interview you because she loves science fiction. And I was just thinking that there was a gender-bending kind of episode of Star Trek early on, but of course I didn't, you know, I wasn't ever a Trekkie, but she could pull it up if she were talking to you now. Do you happen to know what, what I'm talking about? I, I'm probably thinking of something different, but I know on Star Trek Discovery, which is one of the more recent series, and my personal favorite, but um, <laughs> there's, there is at least one character who is clearly canonically and explicitly non-binary. Um, and they're kind of like, I don't know, they're kind of stiff about it. Like uh. the, the writing is kind of stiff. I think it's probably mostly cis people writing it. Sure. Sure. Um, but I was so happy to see that. And there's there's some expansion there. But it's interesting because I feel like most most of the time when people write aliens, they're, they either don't deal with gender at all or they they say okay there are males and females and it's just like humans and one of the few exceptions i can think of are the rock people in the marvel movies who i guess are all male and are therefore all sort of inherently gay which is wonderful um but it's rare that we delve into that and that's strange because there's so much I see science fiction as a way to delve into ideas um, without necessarily having to work with them in the framework of normal daily reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of possibilities there. You're right. 
And we'll have to have you on again to, when that gets going. But let me ask you a basic question. How do you start a podcast? Oh, well, of course, you need to start with an idea and you need to have a way to record it, which depending on how picky you're being can be very easy. Um, Zoom. And you sign up for can you sign up for a Zoom account and do a podcast that way? Yes. And so I do actually record my podcasts myself through Zoom. Uh -huh. Um I try to make sure my guests have decent mics. Um the audio engineering is I'm always shooting for good enough that you don't notice it. Yeah. So that you can hear everything. That's as that's as far as because I'm not I'm not a a, a uh, an expert sound engineer or anything. But then you have the distribution part. Um, and there are many, many podcasting services. So um, it's the easiest thing from my point of view is to use a distribution service. Um, I will, I hope, remember in a minute the one that I use, but it took a while to set it up because you have to sort of connect it to accounts on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and all the others. Um, so you, you set to, all those up. Do you have to pay for that? You do for the service that I use, which is called Buzzsprout. I just remembered it. It's I recommend it. I definitely don't get any kickbacks or anything, but it's been very easy to use because once it's set up, you just upload the podcasts, you enter things like titles and keywords and so forth and click publish and it'll go out all those different places and then in addition i take a a little snippet of html and i post that on our website so you can listen it, to it on all the genders.com as well so once you get going it's not super difficult except that learning some sound engineering is useful um, I started out using a tool called Audacity, which can do many things and is free. But Audacity, with Audacity, you edit destructively. If you make a change, you're making a change to your sound file. So if you make a change and then 15 changes later, you're like, you know what? I want to do that a little differently. You're kind of out of luck if you're using something like Audacity. So I recently switched to Pro Tools, which costs money, which Audacity doesn't, but Pro Tools, and there are free uh, digital audio workstations like this too, but Pro Tools happens to be a very good one. Um, and that, with that, you can like apply some reverb and then 15 steps later, you're like, there's too much reverb. I'm going to go turn that down a little bit. Uh, so it makes things much easier and much smoother. Sorry, I'm getting too deep into the weeds. Well, one thing that happened when I was researching your show, I've had all these computer problems lately. And, but mm -hmm. at one point, I Googled all the genders from another device, and it said this domain is for sale for $7,000. That's interesting. Isn't it? You might because be. It's not. <laughs> um, I wonder if they were trying to sell you. Wow. Let me see. Let me make sure my podcast is still there. Well, I found it. I found everything. There it is. I closed it. It is not it. for sale. That is a misconception. I don't know what they were trying to tell you, but I, I'm glad they didn't get your $7,000. Did you have to, you had to buy the domain then though? I had to register the domain, but if it's a domain nobody else is already using, that's that cost is on the order of $20 a year. Mm -hmm. um, if oh, somebody else owns it, then it's whatever, whatever they'll take for it, which so it's nice to come up with a name for your podcast where you can get a domain that is not already in use. Although if it's short, it can be, you know, whatever podcast.com and maybe that's not in use. Um, but, you know, the shorter, the better, of course, but the short ones all went years ago. Is it, you know, it seems like a lot of people have podcasts these days, like Rachel Maddow, a lot of big celebs. Do they get paid? Is there any way to make a living as a podcaster? There is. So there are companies that um, 
put out podcasts and they have advertising that goes with them and they make money through the advertising and they pay the people who make the podcasts. There are individual podcasters who do that. In my case, I just don't like commercials. I make enough money to live on through my day job. And so there are no commercials, no advertisements or anything. Although in the center of gravity, there will be commercials, but they will be fake commercials in vintage styles. So for instance, there's a commercial for what goo 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 synthetic brains. Um, <laughs> there's a, a, a commercial for um, a clicking noise attachable um, appendages, uh, <laughs> things like this. And they're, they're sort of the ones that I've done so far that I've written so far sort of have a, a 50s, 60s feel. Oh, that sounds hey, like folks. Do you ever I remember when Saturday Night Live pioneered commercials that were really jokes? Oh, yes. Oh, I love that. Absolutely love that. But not as much as I love vintage joke commercials, because there's something about a warm sounding, trustworthy spokesperson saying something that's almost completely false that <laughs> i don't know that tickles me to know it believe it or not we're getting to the end of our conversation let me ask you if you have final words for our audience wow um people's pronouns are important if you have someone in your life who has pronouns that are not the pronouns you would otherwise have used for them, please practice using them on your own instead of getting them wrong and apologizing to the person repeatedly. Um, sorry, that's my my standard PSA. Um, also, um, I'd urge anybody who has suggested guests or feedback or questions about all the genders, get in touch with me. I'm pretty responsive. Um, and also, it's just it's lovely to have this conversation with you, and I, I really appreciate um, being welcomed onto your show. Well, I appreciate your joining us because I really uh, enjoyed the podcast, and I've learned a lot, and I plan, I'm a regular fan now. And I encourage the audience also to tune in, allthegenders.com, because it's really diverting and entertaining and informative. So thank you for doing it, Quinn. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. So for this interview show, I thought we might do something a little different. Okay. Your people are used to seeing me interview politicians. Oh. But well. so and, and that person who is already talking with me might be a local business person by the name of Sarah D. Police, who as you're walking down Main Street, you look up and there's Bailey Road. Don't hesitate, walk inside and be greeted for something that you might not expect. So welcome, Sarah. What a great welcome. And I, I understand that actually the name Bailey Road comes from the name of your family farm. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that's right. Bailey's were my great, great grandparents. And I grew up on Bailey Road and my grandparents were there, all my aunts and uncles. And we had little roads in the woods kind of connecting our house. So Bailey Road in Northfield is what the store is named after. It's this so, picturesque white farmhouse, black shutters, bright red barn. It was pretty magical. So your your red blazer today might be your salute to Little Red Riding Hood and going <laughs> on all of those trails between your family homes. What a good connection, yeah. Okay, so you grew up in Northfield, so Montpelier was your backyard, but what made you decide that you really wanted Vermont to continue to be your home? Why, why um, here? Yeah, I, I ventured out. I went to UVM. I graduated from UVM in 2010, and I tried to go other places. I lived in Spain for a year. I lived off the coast of Maine for a few years. I traveled down to Florida, but 
Vermont was always home and my family is here. And I feel like when you grow up in such an amazing place, it's hard to, it's hard to want to leave. You try to grow your wings, but you realize that Vermont was just kind of in my heart. So when, when I talked with you briefly before, you shared a very interesting employment pattern <laughs> yeah. that, that might have had a little something to do with finally deciding that, oh, oh, okay, I really want to stay here. So could you share a little bit about that with people? Yeah. Um, so I graduated from UVM and I was an economics degree. So I thought I was supposed to work in finance and in a bank. So I worked at Northfield Savings Bank, which was not, I was just so bored. I was really bored. And so I decided that I needed some adventure in my life. So I wrote some letters to captains off the coast of Maine who sailed windjammers. So these are like hundred foot vessels, seven sails. It's the real deal. And I was hired on one called the Angelique, which had beautiful red sails. And I worked on that for two years. So I would be in Maine, um, in Camden, Maine from April to October. And then I would come home in the winter and I worked at a small boutique in Montpelier and I coached basketball. Um, and so I would do that in the winter, then I would go back sailing. But after two years, I really wanted to put down some roots. I had met my now wife at the time, so I had fallen in love. And I was just kind of ready to be in one spot and bigger than this tiny little um, cabinet that I was sleeping in because there's small quarters on a sail ship. I was going to say, from, from what I recall, when we talk about having a little overnight bag, that's literally all you could carry into that cabin. Okay, yeah. so Montpelier and retail. Mm -hmm. What? What is it about retail that was attractive to you? And what about doing retail in Montpelier specifically yeah. seemed inviting to you? Um, retail in general and running your own retail store is, there's so many pieces to it. I love numbers. And so running the business end of things, I feel like even though when I first opened the store, it was all about fashion. 80% of the business is all about the numbers. And I really enjoyed that. But the 20%, which was fashion forward, um, you really get to interact with people. And I found that I was, I enjoyed making people feel at home and feel welcome when they walk in the doors. And so it was a really great mix of being a people person, being a numbers person, and being able to be creative in my displays and my mannequins. And so it was a really good balance of all the things that I liked to do. And when it comes to Montpelier, Montpelier is really special. It's um, a walkable and shoppable downtown. And it's small. You know all the business owners. You have your favorite coffee shop. They know your special order. And it's it's really special, the downtowns that Mont that Montpelier is, but Vermont has a few of these downtowns that are walkable and shoppable. And people come from all over the country to experience something like that. And, and I'm going to warn people right now that when you visit Bailey Road, you're going to walk in thinking, okay, I'm just going to wander around and look at a few things. And before you know it, you're going to be telling Sarah your life story. Nope. <laughs> you're you're going to you're going to feel at home. Yeah. And and you're going to see things that you didn't expect. Now, as as you sort of alluded to, your original vision for Bailey Road and what Bailey Road is now isn't the same thing. No. This has grown. So can you share a little bit about the original vision for Bailey Road and how that's expanded into something totally unique? Yeah. Um, so I, throughout college, I worked at Banana Republic, which was clothing retail. And then in those winter off season, I worked at Adorn, which was clothing retail. So I knew that and I felt confident enough to start my own business when it came to just clothing. Um, so that's where I started. And I knew how to work with people in a dressing room and how to build a wardrobe. But once COVID hit, I found that people's um, habits were changing. They were working more from home. The need for a larger wardrobe was kind of shifting away. And I was finding that people wanted to nest in their home and create 
a welcoming space for where they were spending all their time. And so we grew through COVID by adapting quickly to what people's needs were, whether that was less suits and blazers and more candles and soft pillows. Um, and we jumped online quickly through our website and Facebook Live and Instagram events. So we were able to stay relevant for people and meet people where they were, which was at their home. And so it went from a 1200 square foot store, mostly clothing, to now we're at a 2400 square foot store, half clothing, half like home and gifts. So is there something that's a specialty at Bailey Road? Something yeah. that I'm going to something that I'm going to find there that I may not find someplace else. Yeah, um, we are known when it comes to clothing, I'm really known for my style sessions where we offer like a one on one personalized focused session with people. And when I first created the service, um, it was I had in mind people who absolutely love shopping. They wanted the whole store to themselves and they just wanted a shopping party. And I was going to be there for that. Um, but the more I realized that this service was feeling a need for people who would walk into a store and feel overwhelmed, they would feel intimidated, they didn't know where to start. And so little by little, it became this service we would provide people who was going through maybe like a life change, an identity change, um, whether it's for a career or postpartum or transitioning. And it was just, it became this magical safe space for people to come and create the wardrobe that they wanted to be in. And if I'm hearing your, you correctly, I could be looking for something that's casual to something that's maybe a little more formal or something that's a business attire and maybe something that's like black velvet with some sparkle. <laughs> yeah, I think you saw a dress that you might like here, Kevin. We do so, have a little black velvet rhinestone action. <laughs> it could be. Now, yeah. I heard you sort of made a brief reference to people who are transitioning. Mm -hmm. So part of our conversation is you have already reached out to and worked with people from within our transgender community, helping yeah. them to find, you know, an, an identity that is theirs, a style that is theirs, mm -hmm. and more importantly, taking the time to ensure I'm finding you something that is really going to fit who you now are, correct? Yeah, yeah and I think I can only imagine what that, um, I can only imagine what that process is and all the work that it took to have your insides match your outsides and to get to the point and the courage to approach somebody for a style session. And so I think I already come in humbled to a style session like that, knowing that this person I'm working with has done a lot of work to get to where they are when I meet them. And so I'm just there to kind of help push them to the next step of being able to walk outside their home and walk outside their closet, just feeling, you know, with a kick in your step and like a little strut in your step. And I, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm just there to like help towards the end because they've already done a lot of the hard work to get where they've been. But, but you've created a safe environment for that to occur. So, yeah. so I want to ask, what was it like coming into the Montpelier business community? Was the Montpelier business community receptive to your vision of what you wanted to create for Bailey Road and, and how that business has grown? Yeah, the business community was very accepting. I think they were welcoming to kind of like new energy entering the downtown, which was awesome. Um, within like the first year of opening Bailey Road, I became the president of the Montpelier Business Society, which is great. We were, before COVID, we were meeting once a month and it was a nice group to kind of just like, when you own your own business, it can be isolating in a way because you don't really have coworkers. And so being able to meet monthly was really helpful for that. Um, it also was an interesting, it was interesting to step into because a lot of the businesses downtown are 
um, cornerstones and that they've been here for 30 years, 40 years, beer upon books, capital stationers, the drawing board, um, capital grounds, like a lot of these places have been here for forever. And so for me, I was intimidated because here are these businesses that are institutions. Um, but I feel like they were so welcoming to have newness come into the town. So I, it's really great. I, I would be intimidated to start a business like this almost anywhere else, I think. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of business because right now we're hearing a lot about the labor market and not being able to find staff. And I know that in addition to being this phenomenal businesswoman, you also may be the mother of two young children. And <laughs> yeah. What and 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 I know that that wife Emily is there to be of assistance, but what is it like for you running Bailey Road? Um, it's a lot to juggle, that's for sure. But Emily is a very supportive partner. Um, but I have an amazing team here at Bailey Road, and I have a mix. It's an amazing mix. I have a mix of retired professionals who have left their long long career, but still kind of want to have a hand in the community. And so they're amazing. They're brilliant and they get it. They get that I'm a mom of two young kids and they get sick and I have to call out and they just, they're just there to support me, which is awesome. So I have a mix of my retired professionals and then I have a mix of um, students and I'm really picky with what high school students I, and college students I bring onto the team, but it's great to have the mix of people experiencing all different seasons of life. And so when we have our team dinners, we have people talking about retirement and how they want their like their next season of life to look like, whether it's half the year here, half the year somewhere else. And then we have students talking about applying for colleges or um studying for the SATs or we share pictures of their prom pictures and we all get so excited and it's just a group of women that are there to support each other and me having two children it adds to kind of the mix of holy moly we're all in this life together and we're all in different stages and it's pretty incredible when we all can kind of sit down and chat. Okay you're talking about team dinners as though this is a scheduled ongoing event that happens with the people who are part of the Bailey Road family. Is that correct? Yeah, I like to have fancy dinners. I like to get dressed up. And I think my team likes to get dressed up. I like to eat good food. And so it's, we usually have a big dinner um, in January. And then we have another one like middle of the year. The last one we went to was Michael's on the Hill. Oh no, it was Hen of the Woods. And we sat at that sunken table in, in Waterbury. So that was really great. Um, and I think it's really important because it's retail. It's not like I can offer the best benefits and it's not like I offer a salary, like, um, I don't have any full-time people, so I don't offer a full salary, but I can spoil them when I can. And because retail is so up and down when it comes to our sales, it's a lot easier for me to once in a while, when we're having a good month, be able to treat people in that way. Well, oh, that sounds wonderful. Okay, yeah. so are are there is there anything coming up for Bailey Road that people should be writing on their calendar saying, ah. okay, that it's the year end sale and I can't <laughs> miss this. Well, we just had our holiday party on December first, so that was kind of our big celebration and thank you to our customers. But I mean, these next two weeks is like the. It's like the Super Bowl for retail. We are in it right now. And so come on down, especially if you have any of those last minute gifts. It's really nice to be able to walk into a store, hear the creaky floor, the like whirling ceiling fan, smell the candles, touch the clothing. Like it is a full on experience when you walk into the store that you really can't get anywhere else. You are coming in to kind of just like immerse yourself in this beautiful environment. And so I, I love inviting people into our shop. And I would be able to go in and find a range of things from wonderful Christmas ornaments to candles to yeah. soaps that I can actually try in the store mm -hmm. and 
earrings and accessories and scarves and yeah. all kinds of wonderful apparel. Yeah. We have apparel and ornaments, like you said. There's a full kitchen set up where you can try our hand soaps. It's a working sink. We also carry furniture and rugs and artwork. We have a lot of um, Vermont made products in the store. So it's a really nice mix. And I will be sure to put up both the website and the Facebook page so people Thank can you. go on and get a sense of what we're talking about. Yeah. And pictures might have been taken of merchandise that could be. <laughs> might have been displayed during this yeah. so thank you for Aww, spending this time you. with us and be be looking for me coming through the door okay i will be you're hard to miss kevin <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you thank you for joining us and until next time remember resist <laughs>